tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Shudder. What's your favorite scary movie? An inconvenient truth. Oh, look how noble you are. All right, let's pretend for a minute that the planet we live on isn't slowly dying of cancer. Whoa. Well, this is nice. God, I, I feel so much less stressed. Wait, don't, don't answer that question right away. Let's just, let's just enjoy it. Wait, what? Tales from the Hood? No! No! You, oh. What's the point of living? We all just go about our stupid little routines like we're not living on borrowed time. We're done. As a race, how can we possibly bring children into this dying world? Oh, God, if you're out there, please help us now, for we know not what we do. Hmm. That is a good choice, though. Tragically rare anthology horror, charmingly 90s social commentary, memorable Clarence Williams III performance. I don't know if it's art. It is. But I like it. Woo! Man, I feel an overwhelming sense of calm and tranquility in the face of imminent disaster. And you will too. With Shudder. Because if you like your movies to be so scary they're good, or just scary good, Shudder has what you need. A new horror movie or series every week, hopefully until the world ends. Which could be soon. With Shudder, you can stream supernatural, thriller, and horror movies and TV shows across all your favorite devices. This fantastic, scarifying, and ever-growing library of ad-free entertainment can be yours for just $5.99 a month. Shudder has everything supernatural, thriller, and horror. I can't get enough of it, and you are going to love it too. And right now, you can stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free. Go to Shudder.com and use code HORRORHILL. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, code HORRORHILL. Stream free for your first 30 days by going to Shudder.com, code HORRORHILL. Thank you for your support of this program and the sponsors that make it possible.
Well, hello. Fancy seeing you here. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 24. I'm your host, Jason Hill. And woof, I am beat. Man fest. Really took it out of me. But don't worry. I'm sure we'll do another... Man fest. Sometime in the future. When I have the strength. But until then, we have come to the season finale. And another one bites the dust. But Jason, you ask, why do you have seasons if you don't take breaks in between? That's a good question. This podcast is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Remember earlier what I was saying about relationships? How it's important not to neglect the one you have with yourself? Well, it is. Remember, you can never really leave you. You can't divorce yourself. You're stuck together. Whether it's hitting the gym, making time for your haircut, or even trying therapy, which is what I'm recommending you do, because you probably need it, most people do, you are your greatest asset. And this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship. And that, yeah, the one you have with yourself here, you see where this is going. So be sure to invest the time and effort into you that you do for other people. BetterHelp's online therapy offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. You never have to sit in a waiting room or see anyone on camera if you do not want to. It's much more affordable, much more available, and you can be speaking to someone in under 48 hours, so give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. I like BetterHelp. Nay, I love it. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Horror Hill. And Scary Stories listeners get their first month off at BetterHelp.com slash Horror Hill. That is BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Horror Hill. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Tonight's story comes from author Tim Wagner, and it's a bloody one. So that's good. Just remember, please become a patron, kick those ads to the curb, and you'll get the whole gang. Everything produced by Chilling Tales since the dawn of time. Just go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today, and you will get everything. Everything from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Because every time you patronize a podcast, a maggot gets its wings. Oh, isn't that lovely? But enough talk, because it's story time on the Horror Hill. So don't worry about trying to find the darkness, because the darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Tim Wagner, I give you a touch of madness. Christina Lawson sat at a corner table in a small cafe, coffee sitting in front of her, gloved hands tucked beneath her legs. Folk pop music played over the cafe's sound system in a vain attempt to give the place a relaxing atmosphere. But it was filled with so many people, ordering at the counter, sitting and talking to one another, working behind the counter and operating various whirring, whooshing or grinding machines, and the air thrummed with tension. She glanced around at the other customers, a couple sitting at a table, 
each involved in whatever was displayed on their phone screens instead of looking at each other. A father sitting with his twin daughters, who were five at the most, and dressed in superhero outfits complete with capes. One green, one red. Sipping juice boxes while their dad drank his coffee. A pair of middle-aged women in blue medical smocks talking over coffee and pastries after a long hospital shift. And a dozen more, including the staff behind the counter. All of them appeared completely normal. Completely sane. But she knew better than most that appearances didn't mean shit. Anything could be happening behind their eyes. Their thoughts, a chaotic maelstrom of wild imperceptions and barely restrained homicidal impulses. Any one of them could be on the verge of succumbing to the lunacy raging inside. And then, all hell would break loose. Pam would have told her she was being paranoid, and maybe so. But she'd seen it happen before, and if it had happened once... It could happen again. She wasn't sure why Pam had asked to have their session in a public place like this instead of her office. No doubt she thought there was a good reason for it. Maybe some new type of therapy that she wanted to try. But Christina wasn't comfortable around people. Especially this many. She looked down at the tabletop to avoid meeting anyone's gaze. She flexed her hands felt them move under her legs, was reassured to know that they were still protected. She made no move to touch the coffee in front of her. She didn't want it. Didn't really like coffee much. She only bought it so she wouldn't look any stranger sitting there than she already did. Pam rushed into the shop then. Blonde hair, a frizzy mess. Makeup slightly askew as if she'd applied it too fast. She looked around saw Christina, smile, and hurried over to her table. Sorry I'm late, she said. Do you mind if I order something before we get started? Christina did mind. She wanted to get whatever this was over as soon as possible. But she shook her head. Pam smiled again, then headed to the counter. There was a line, and Christina watched her stand there for several moments until it was her time to order. She trusted Pam, as much as she trusted anyone, that is. She'd seen a number of therapists over the years, most of whom had treated her as if she was the crazy one. Pam had been the first to treat her as if she was a person, instead of merely a psychologically fascinating puzzle to be solved. A shattered porcelain doll, whose pieces needed to be put back together. She'd been seeing Pam for almost two years, and she couldn't deny they'd made progress together. Two years ago, she never could have come into a place like this by herself, order a drink, sit, and wait for someone. But here she was. And if she wasn't comfortable, so what? She was here. Pam returned to the table carrying a large cup that most likely contained a latte with an extra shot of espresso. During one of their earliest sessions, she'd mentioned it was her favorite drink. She sat down opposite Christina and took a long sip before setting the cup down on the table. Normally, Pam began their sessions with some chit-chat. How have you been since we last talked? Anything new going on with you? But not this time. I'm sure you're wondering why I asked you to meet me here today. Christina smiled. The thought had crossed my mind. I'd like to try something different today, and I thought this would be a good place for it. Called it, Christina thought. Were you late on purpose in order to give me a chance to handle being by myself? Pam took another sip of her latte. The thought had crossed my mind, she said. And despite herself, Christina laughed. So, what was it like? Pam asked. Tolerable. Although if you'd been much later, I'd probably have left. Good thing I wasn't any later then, huh? Pam's expression grew more serious, became what Christina thought of as her doctor face. 
and she knew their session was about to start in earnest. How are you feeling about the TV show this week? Christina grimaced. Oh, okay, I guess. The bastards have stopped trying to contact me, so that's a relief. The producers of a lurid true crime TV show called Unnatural Acts were doing a segment on Christina's mom. For a month, they bugged her non-stop, desperate to get an on-camera interview with her, but she'd ignored them, and they'd finally decided to go ahead without her participation. She'd had enough media attention over the last decade to last her a lifetime. News reporters who fought to be the one to interview her first. True crime authors who wanted to write books about what had happened. One was eventually published, Blood on Campus, and it had become a modest success. She hated the attention, hated how it always brought the memories of that awful day back full force. For the last ten years, she'd hoped people would forget and find a new atrocity to be fascinated by. But it hadn't happened yet, and she was starting to wonder if it ever would. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, Pam said, then added, kind of. Oh God, don't tell me the producers hired you to be a consultant. Pam's eyes widened in surprise, and then she laughed. No, and even if they asked me, I'd turn them down. It would violate doctor-patient confidentiality. Plus, it would be a total dick move. Christina relaxed. The thought of Pam betraying her like that was too awful to think about. So, what do you want to talk about? She felt her defenses going up. She didn't like to remember that day, let alone talk about it. But Pam had done a lot to help her. So... She'd go along with whatever she wanted to do. To a point. Pam took another sip of her latte, a long one, as if fortifying herself for what came next. We've talked about that day before, she began. Several times. And during those conversations, I never questioned the truth of what you told me. Never disputed the reality of any of it. Christina nodded cautiously. She didn't like where this seemed to be going. Her other therapists had questioned, had tried to convince her that it hadn't happened, or at least that it hadn't happened the way she remembered. One of the things she liked about Pam is that she'd never done that. But maybe she'd just been waiting for what she thought was the right time to bring up the subject. I went to the university yesterday. An ice-cold hand gripped Christina's heart and she began trembling. Pam went on, speaking faster as if hoping to get everything out before she freaked. I'd never been there. I went to college in Chicago before my husband, and I moved to Ohio. It's a beautiful campus, lovely old buildings, lots of grass and trees. Very different from the downtown campus I attended. The science center is not there anymore. They tore it down years ago and planted trees there. They put up a remembrance plaque, too. I think you might find it healing to see it. Christina trembled harder now, and her mouth and throat felt dry as desert sand. She didn't want to reply, but if she tried, her words would have likely come out in a hoarse croak. Pam continued. I looked for the fountain, but I couldn't find it at first. I thought maybe it had been torn down, too. But I found it eventually, and it was peaceful and relaxing, just as you described it. She paused, then added, I took some pictures with my phone. Sudden nausea erupted in Christina's gut, and her vision blurred. She wanted to jump up from her chair and run toward the exit, but she feared that if she tried, she'd pass out before she made it halfway. I'd like to show them to you if that's okay. She wanted to shake her head violently, but she was unable to move. Taking her silence for assent, Pam removed her phone from her purse, brought a picture up on the screen, and then held it out for Christina to see. She scrolled through a series of images, and although Christina wanted to look away, wanted it more than she wanted her next breath, 
she watched the pictures go by, one after the other. Christina saw the statue on a hot afternoon in late July when she was 13 years old. She was supposed to be attending the second morning of a week-long summer science workshop for middle school kids run by the university. But after her mom had dropped her off in front of the science center and drove away in her Lexus, she decided to wander the campus instead. She hated science and never got good grades in it which was the reason her overachieving parents had insisted on signing her up for the workshop. But, as much as she hated science, she hated being told what to do even more. Rules, regulations, do this, don't do that, be a good girl, don't be a bad girl. Why couldn't everyone just leave her alone to do what she wanted, when she wanted? Her parents teachers. All her life, people had told her what to do, and she was sick of it. The only rules she was interested in following were her own. Her parents might have enrolled her in the workshop and paid for it, but they couldn't make her attend if she didn't want to. Yesterday had been so boring. All they had done was make quote-unquote inventions out of cardboard, tape, glue, plastic straws, popsicle sticks, and other odds and ends. More arts and crafts than science, really. Kid stuff, certainly. Today, she planned to skip out and kick around campus for a couple hours until it was time for Mom to pick her up. And then, she'd meet her back in front of the science center and feed her some bullshit about what the instructors had the kids do today. Her parents were smart. Mom was a lawyer. Dad, a pediatrician, but they were so busy they only ever paid partial attention to what she did. Lying to them was almost embarrassingly easy. This wasn't her first time at Ash Creek University. Her parents were both alums who had been dragging her to campus concerts, art shows, and theater productions since she could walk. But in all those visits, and there had been dozens of them, She'd never gotten the chance to explore the place. High time she rectified that, she decided. But after a half hour of walking around in the sun and heat, she was not only bored but miserable. She supposed the campus was pretty enough. Red brick buildings, well-landscaped grounds, large trees. But there wasn't anything to do. And because it was summer, there weren't many people around made the place feel empty and lonely. She did like the fact that no one paid any attention to her. The few people she passed, the students and professors, didn't so much as glance at her, as if a 13-year-old walking around campus by herself was completely normal, and it made her feel very grown up. But she'd been walking non-stop since her mother left, and she was tired and sweaty. And while the campus was pleasant for the most part, There was a lot of construction going on, parking lots being resurfaced, buildings being remodeled, and that meant noise. Machines running, tools striking metal and concrete, people shouting to each other as they worked. She wanted someplace quiet where she could sit in peace for a bit, preferably in the shade. She was on the verge of saying to hell with it and going back to the science center and attending that stupid workshop when she saw the red dumpster. It contained odds and ends from campus construction, chunks of broken concrete, lengths of discarded wood. It was in no way remarkable. She'd seen a dozen like it during her self-guided tour of the campus so far. But what was remarkable was what lay behind it. She almost missed it, so completely did the dumpster block the view. But there was a tiny sliver of space between the side of the dumpster and the old oak tree, and through it, she caught a glimpse of what looked like a fountain. Intrigued, she slipped past the dumpster and found herself standing at the entrance to a... well... She wasn't sure what it was exactly. A place for people to sit, relax, think, 
she supposed? A stone fountain sat atop the third level of a dais, a curving half-circle of stone wall behind it with an arched open doorway in the middle. Wooden benches rested on either side of the doorway, where people could sit and watch the fountain and listen to the gentle trickle of water. The water bubbled up from the center of a large, round stone surface to flow over the edges and into a pool beneath. The water emerged from the edge of the dais in a small waterfall, surrounded by large stones placed to look like a natural formation, with trees surrounding the fountain, separating it from the rest of the world, making it seem as if it were a place out of a fairy tale. A secluded, magical setting that only a lucky few ever found. There was shade here, along with a pleasant breeze and the sound of gently rustling leaves that, combined with the running water, soothed Christina. She knew where she'd be spending the rest of the time until her mother came to get her. Then she looked to the left of the fountain and saw the statue. Her parents had both been raised Catholic, but they weren't religious. Ash Creek University was a private Catholic institution with a reputation for academic excellence, and that was the only reason her parents had come here for their undergraduate degrees. Christina sometimes wondered if they still considered themselves Catholic, culturally, if not spiritually. They took her to Christmas Eve and Easter Mass every year to broaden her horizons, they said. And, on the way home, they'd give her a speech about how religion was nothing more than a way to instill moral values in its followers by using metaphor and symbolism. And it was not to be taken literally. Thanks to her broadened horizons, she recognized the statue of the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary stood atop a granite pedestal, their feet sticking out from beneath the hem of her robe. She held her hands out before her, fingers steepled as if praying, her hood-covered head bowed. There was no expression on her face. Her eyes were closed and her mouth was little more than a line with only a suggestion of lips. But the detail that stood out the most to Christina was what looked like a thick reptilian tail protruding from the back of her robe and curling around her left foot. She frowned upon seeing the tail, or that's what it had to be, couldn't be anything else. She was no expert on Catholic theology, but she felt confident that Mary was not supposed to have a lizard's tail. There was something written on the granite base the statue stood on, and she walked over to read it. It was a single word. Pandemonia. And beneath that, in smaller letters, a quote. If there is a universal mind... Who says it has to be sane? Charles Ford. Was this some kind of weird piece of art? Or maybe a joke of some kind? And then the tail twitched. Just the tip. And it happened so fast she wasn't sure she'd really seen it. She looked up at the statue's face and ice-cold fear hit her when she saw its eyes were now open. They weren't the same gray-white as the rest of the statue, though. Instead, they were a glossy obsidian. And while she could read nothing within their empty blackness, she could feel the weight of the statue's gaze upon her. You do well to shun the false god of science, child. The statue's thin mouth didn't move. Its voice, cold as midnight and dry as ancient bone, echoed in her mind. Science pretends there is order to existence, that for every question there is an answer. This is a lie. 
existence is random and meaningless, and that is glorious. The statue bent toward Christina and stretched its hands toward her. At first, she was so terrified she couldn't move, could only stand and watch the stone fingers draw closer. But then, her survival instincts kicked in and she threw off her paralysis and turned to run. But before she could take more than a single step, the stone tail lashed out and encircled her waist, stopping her. She pulled and tugged, but she could not break free of the tail's stone coils. The statue closed its hard fingers around Christina's right wrist and held her hand steady as its lips parted, and a pearl of thick, dark liquid emerged. It fell onto the back of her hand and sat there for a moment, burning cold on her skin before flattening against her flesh and slowly disappearing into her body. She felt no different, but a shudder raced through her just the same. The soothing rhythm of the fountain ceased, and the sudden silence drew Christina's attention. She glanced over to see the water had stopped flowing, and an instant later, blood welled up from the center of the round stone, crimson and thick. It oozed across the surface, overflowing the stone's edges, falling in ropey threads into the pool below, before finally emerging as a red waterfall. She looked into the statue's obsidian eyes, its face only inches from her now. Go forth and share the gift I have bestowed upon you, my daughter. Free them. Free them all. Hey, hey, horror fan hombres. Earlier, we were talking about how Shudder, the only way to stream thriller, supernatural, and horror movies and TV shows for only $5.99 a month, makes for a good distraction from the imminent and ignoble slow death of life on Earth. That's why I like it, personally. But did you know that Shudder can also distract you from other various lesser catastrophes? You can watch Shudder while you're doing your taxes. You can watch Shudder while your teenage kid tells you that you're soon to be a grandparent. And congratulations. You can watch Shudder while you pass kidney stones. You can watch Shudder while trained professionals remove gallstones. You can even watch Shudder while you are stoned, though it is the official possession of Horror Hill and the Simply Scary Network that we just don't approve of that kind of immoral and degenerate behavior around here. We really don't. We really, really don't. Okay, back to what I was saying. Just name the misery, and Shudder's got what you need to push on through. Shudder's streaming library has just about everything, from original movies like Superhost, The Boy Behind the Door, and a longtime personal favorite of mine, PG Psycho Warman, to hit series like Creepshow, from The Walking Dead to Greg Nicotero. If you're looking for old classics or simply the next classic, mm, see what I did there? You will want to dive right into Shutter's collection from around the world, with favorites like Halloween and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, along with must-see new releases like VHS 94 and Hellbender. You want a recommendation? Try Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, a movie I worshipped in the 90s, even snuck into. There was no internet, you kinda had to do that then. I'm telling you, Billy Zane could have given Clarence Williams III a run for his money in that one. Hmm. If it makes you feel good, do it! Oh, God, isn't he great? Oh, I love that guy. But yeah, that's Shudder for you. 
I like it. Nay, I love it. Then you should try it. Because as Billy Zane says, if it makes you feel good, duh. Because Shudder has everything supernatural, thriller, and horror. I cannot get enough of it. You are going to love it too. And right now, you can stream your first 30 days of Shudder for free! Go to Shudder.com and use code HORRORHILL. That is Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com, code HORRORHILL. Think of a cow's udder with a shh in front of it. Stream free for your first 30 days by going to Shudder.com, code HORRORHILL. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Christina had no memory of the statue releasing her, no memory of beginning to run. One moment she was standing there, trapped in the statue's embrace, staring into its obsidian eyes. And the next she was running full out, heart pounding, lungs heaving, sweat pouring off her. She had no destination in mind, wasn't capable of anything approaching rational thought at that moment. Her body operated on autopilot, returning her to the place she'd started from, the science center. She was relieved to see her mom's Lexus parked in front of the building, and she ran straight to it, only partially aware of the tears streaming down her face. She ran to the driver's side window and began pounding on it to get her mother's attention. It was several moments before she realized the car was empty. There you are! Christina stopped pounding on the window and looked up to see her mother exiting the science building, her face a mask of anger. She continued chiding Christina as she walked toward her. I was in a meeting with a client when the workshop director called to ask me why you weren't present today. I hauled ass down here, grinding my teeth to nubs the whole way. Why can't you, for once in your life, do what you're supposed to do? She trailed off as she reached Christina, her expression softening. Are you okay, honey? Why are you crying? Did something happen? Before Christina could respond, her mom took hold of her hands and gave them a reassuring squeeze. The instant their flesh came in contact, her mother stiffened, and her eyes widened in shock. She began shaking her head as if trying to deny something only she could see. She paled, an expression of absolute horror coming onto her face. But, instead of turning away from the unseen whatever it was, she continued looking, and slowly, her features slackened, and her expression became placid. She remained like that for several heartbeats, still holding on to Christina's hands, and then she spoke in a calm, almost toneless voice. Thank you. I understand now. She looked at Christina and in the same flat voice said, I'm going to go tell the director I found you and you're safe. I'll be back in a minute. She released Christina's hands, turned, walked back into the building. Christina's tears subsided to a trickle but she was no longer aware of them. She stared at the glass door that was the entrance to the science building, unable to escape the feeling that something was terribly wrong. For a moment, she forgot about the statue, or rather she forced herself not to think of it. When Mom got mad, really mad, she stayed that way for a while, sometimes hours, Christina had never seen her calm down so quickly and completely. It was like a switch had been thrown inside her, shutting off all her emotions. It was beyond weird. And that's when the screaming began. It was muffled, but the sound was unmistakable. It came from somewhere inside the building, where the science workshop was taking place. She saw a smallish, 
child-sized hand slap the window from the inside. The hand was covered with blood and left a red smear on the glass as it slid away. Her own paralysis was broken by the sight and she ran into the building and went up the stairs, taking them two and three at a time. The screams grew louder and fewer the closer she got to the second floor, and they were punctuated by moans of pain. She slowed as she approached the classroom where the workshop was held. She didn't want to go in, didn't want to see whatever waited for her. But she had to. Her mother was in there. The door was open, and by the time she reached it, the sounds had stopped. No more screams. No more moans. Just silence. She stepped inside, not far, only a foot or so. The room was set up the same way as it had been yesterday. Ten circular tables with chairs around them. Materials for students to use in constructing their projects in the middle. It was more like art class than science which had been one of the reasons she'd found it so boring. But what she saw now wasn't boring. Far from it. Bodies were scattered around the classroom, but there were a couple of adults as well. Some lay on the floor in various positions, while others had collapsed into chairs or onto desks. They had sustained numerous cuts, and blood was everywhere, on their clothes, on the desks and chairs, on the floor and walls, and all the corpses, around twenty in total, appeared to have died the same way, by having their throats cut. Christina's mother stood in the middle of the room, holding a pair of box cutters, her clothes, hands, and face covered in blood. She turned to face Christina and smiled, her teeth a startling patch of white in her otherwise crimson face. Thank you for helping me to see how things really are, sweetie. Thank you for setting me free. She raised both box cutters and pressed the tips of the razors to the small hollow at the base of her neck. And then, with a pair of vicious outward swipes, she laid open her throat. Blood fountained from the wound to join that which already covered her. If she felt any pain, her voice didn't show it. Her smile widened, and her eyes seemed to almost glow. Christina didn't know the word beatific, but if she had, that is how she would have described her mother's expression. Her mother stood like that for a time, but eventually... The box cutter slipped from her hands and thumped to the floor. A moment later, she joined them, collapsing and staring up at the ceiling with wide, unblinking eyes. Her smile, however, remained in place. And then, it was Christina's turn to scream. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. How are you? Humans ask that question a lot, seemingly constantly, again and again, like crickets on a cool summer's eve. How are you? How you doing? How are things? Why do you smell like rubbing alcohol and benzene all the time? Ignore that last one that's a little more me-specific. But back to those tedious greetings and banal pleasantries, how often do you actually answer those questions honestly? 
I'm gonna take a guess and say less than 50% of the time. Internal lives, we've all got them. And we all feel like we have to hide them most of the time. Hmm. I know I do. Oof. Do I? But it would be nice to just be able to answer honestly sometimes. Yeah, it would. I know it's helped me in the past. Helped me enormously. I was getting to the point where I was worried that if one more person was going to ask about how I was doing, I would scream. And if better help hadn't come along, well, I probably would have. Since then, my relationship with my counselor has become one of the most important relationships in my life. And relationships take work. Think of it as being in a romantic relationship with yourself. Except there's three of you, including the counselor. No, this is not going to get dirty. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? That's where your better help counselor comes in. Keeping you true to your relationship with yourself. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. So give it a try. See why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Horror Hill, a horror anthology and scary stories. Listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. That is B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Christina saw the fountain, the stone wall behind it, the rocks in front of it, the trees surrounding it. But there was one thing she didn't see on the phone screen. The statue. I checked with the campus groundkeeper's office, Pam said, and they told me that not only isn't there a statue next to the fountain, there never has been in the university's 122-year history. She closed the phone's photo app and replaced the device in her purse. There was no statue, Christina. In your mind, yes, but not in the physical world. It didn't infect you with... She frowned, as if unsure how to put it. With its madness and you didn't pass it on to your mother when she grabbed your hands. You aren't responsible for what she did. And you never were. All of Christina's therapists had argued that the statue wasn't real, at least not the way she'd perceived it. But none had gone so far as to visit the campus and take pictures, let alone check to see if the statue had ever existed. A part of her that was still 13 and maybe always would be, wanted to shout at Pam, accuse her of lying. But the rest of her, the woman she had become in the last ten years, wanted to believe her. What a comfort it would be to believe that her mother had done what she'd done for some other reason than because she touched her daughter's hand and come into contact with the contagion that pandemonia had infected her with. I know how to prove that you had nothing to do with what happened, Pam said. But you will have to trust me. Do you trust me, Christina? She hesitated, but then managed a single nod. Good. Good. Now put your hands on the table. Christina stared at her. Not quite sure she'd heard correctly. You told me that you've worn gloves every day for the last ten years. That you won't even take the right one off to bathe. All because you don't want 
to risk infecting anyone else. Yes. She'd been extremely, no, obsessively careful over the years. But if there was no statue, there is no infection to pass on, and that means you can touch someone without anything bad happening. So you can touch me. Pam put her left hand on the table, palm up. Christina looked at Pam's hand, head swimming with vertigo. What's more likely to be true? That some... thing chose you to spread some kind of psychological plague? Or that your mind made up that incident so you wouldn't have to believe that your mother was responsible for killing all those people. Christina knew which of the choices was the most logical, but that didn't necessarily make it the correct one. Still, she took a deep breath and slid her hands out from under her legs. She wanted to get better, she truly did. And she recognized that this would be a huge step toward making that possible. She removed her left glove, the one that she really didn't need to wear, and placed it on the table. And then, after another moment's hesitation, she removed the right and placed it next to the left. The air felt cold on the exposed skin of her hands, but it felt stimulating too. Then, slowly, Fighting every instinct inside her that screamed she shouldn't be doing this. She lowered her right hand onto Pam's. And for the first time since that day, she touched another human being. Pam curled her fingers upward to grasp hers and tears of joy welled in Christina's eyes. Pam had been right. The statue hadn't been real. It hadn't. Pam's eyes glazed over, and her features went slack. She pulled her hand away from Christina's. No, Christina whispered. No, 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 no. Pam didn't respond. Instead, she rose from the table and walked toward the counter. But, instead of stopping in front of the register, she continued on, stepping behind the counter where the staff were working. They looked at her for a moment, as if uncertain what to say or do. Then, one of them, a skinny twenty-something with a goatee and a man bun, stepped forward to block her way. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you're not. Pam reached down, and from somewhere Christina could not see from the table, grabbed hold of a knife. It was long and sharp with a black plastic handle, one of the implements the staff used when preparing sandwiches or slicing bagels. Manbun started to raise his hands as if he thought he could ward off Pam by gesture alone. But before he could complete the gesture, Pam swiped the blade across his throat in a single, swift motion. Flesh parted, blood spurted, and Manbun clapped his hands to his throat in a ridiculously ineffective attempt to stop the bleeding. People started screaming then. And while some stared at Pam dumbfounded, the majority bolted for the door. Too many tried to go through it at the same time, but the crowd behind them pushed until the jam was broken and everyone could get through. Pam turned away from the bleeding man whose mouth kept opening and closing like a fish as he attempted to speak. But all he managed were wet clicking sounds. And then... His eyes rolled white, and he slumped to the floor. 
His co-workers gaped at his prone form for a second, but when Pam came out from around the corner and started back toward Christina, they saw the opportunity to get the hell out of there, and they lost no time in doing so, fleeing into the street after their departed customers. By the time Pam returned to the table, still gripping the knife, blade slick with blood, the cafe was empty, except for the two of them. Christina wanted to look away from Pam's gaze, wanted to close her eyes and wait to feel the knife's edge kiss on her throat, but she forced herself to meet her therapist's eyes. She half expected to see that they had become a glossy obsidian, but they looked the same as they always had, save for the complete and total lack of anything resembling human emotion within them. You were given a gift. Pam spoke in a toneless voice that reminded Christina of the way her mother had spoken before going inside the science building. And you've wasted it. Moving so swiftly that Christina hardly saw her move, Pam grabbed hold of her right wrist and pressed her hand to the table. Time to return what you've squandered. She pressed the sharp edge of the knife against the tender skin of Christina's wrist. Christina impressed herself by not feeling afraid. It would be a relief to be rid of Pandemonia's dark gift, and if she bled to death after Pam performed her impromptu amputation, well, what of it? At least she would have kept her sanity at the end. She gritted her teeth to steel herself for the pain to come and curled her right hand into a fist, the tips of her fingers pressing hard into her palm. Ten years she had avoided touching herself with her right hand, terrified of what might happen. Now she knew. Now she understood. Pam kept the blade pressed against her skin for another moment, but then she pulled it away and released her grip on Christina's wrist. Face still expressionless, eyes still dead, she handed the knife to Christina and then stood there, waiting. Christina examined the blade, turning it this way and that to see how the light played across the metal. The barista's blood still clung to the knife, and she brought the blade to her mouth and licked it clean. She cut her own tongue in the process, but she didn't care. The pain was exquisite, and the blood she swallowed, hers mixed with his tasted sweeter than any wine. She looked at Pam. Thank you. For everything, she said. And then rammed the blade into the woman's chest, expertly slipping it between a pair of ribs and into her heart. The non-expression on Pam's face didn't change as she slipped free of the blade and collapsed to the floor dead. Instead of licking the knife this time, Christina wiped it on her cheeks, smearing them with Pam's blood. Many times over the years, she tried to imagine what it had been like inside her mother's mind after she'd experienced the dark touch. The closest she could have come to was to imagine Mom's skull as a hive filled with angry, buzzing bees furiously trying to sting one another to death. She was surprised to discover she hadn't been far off the mark. The sound, one of absolute and total disorder, was magnificent. It was the song of discord and upheaval, of malady and torment, of decay and dissolution, and she could not wait to share it with the world. She heard Pandemonia's voice one last time. That's my girl. Christina tossed the knife onto Pam's lifeless body and started walking toward the door. 
she flexed the fingers of her right hand, as if limbering them up. She had work to do. Important work. And she couldn't wait to get started. You've been listening to A Touch of Madness by author Tim Wagner. Tim Wagner's first novel came out in 2001, and he's published close to 50 novels and seven collections of short stories since. He writes original fantasy and horror as well as media tie-ins. His novels include Like Death, considered a modern classic in the genre, and the popular Necropolis series of urban fantasy novels. He's written tie-in fiction for Supernatural, Alien, Grimm, The X-Files, Doctor Who, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and Transformers, just to name a few. His articles on writing have appeared in Writer's Digest, Writer's Journal, and Writer's Workshop of Horror. He's won the Bram Stoker Award and been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award, the Scribe Award, and the Splatterpunk Award. In addition to writing, Tim is also a full-time tenured professor who teaches creative writing and composition at Sinclair College. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time, and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you support this show, and that also means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness. I bet you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill, unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program 
and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode, and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, You'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>